A WNBA game sold out an NBA arena, but one of the players involved isn't happy with how it went down. Dartmouth basketball players are continuing their fight to unionize, and we have some interesting new details in the lawsuit to keep the NBA on TNT. It's Thursday, August 22nd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today we'll be speaking to Brendan Glasheen, the play-by-play announcer who called Tuesday's sold-out game between the Connecticut Sun and Los Angeles Sparks at the Celtics TD Garden. Our reporter Amanda Christovich fills us in on the Dartmouth case she says could eventually end amateurism for college athletes. And my colleague Alex Schiffer breaks down some unique wrinkles in Warner Bros. Discovery's lawsuit to try to keep NBA media rights beyond this coming season. We'll also touch on some interesting stadium renderings and the Yankees living up to their city's reputation. Let's start with some headlines. Dartmouth men's basketball is continuing to fight for the right to formally unionize. Representatives for the players filed a complaint to the NLRB alleging the school refuses to enter collective bargaining conversations with athletes. Dartmouth responded in a statement that they were expecting the complaint and said, We maintain that the regional director made an extraordinary mistake in finding these students are employees. The varsity athletes in the Ivy League are not employees. Jeff Bezos has zero interest in buying the Celtics according to the information who cited a source close to the Amazon founder. Whenever the team is sold, it is sure to set a new NBA record, but it seems for now that the world's third richest person won't be there to drive up the price. Jerry Jones gave an update on a new deal for CeeDee Lamb on Tuesday, saying that the two sides had promising talks in recent days. The two parties have been engaged in negotiations for months, and Lamb has not reported to Cowboys training camp. While he would not indicate a number, Jones said that we wouldn't have offered him what we've offered him if we didn't want him to be here. The NWSL is gearing up for expansion, and the league has now taken bids for new teams. Sportico reports that three cities submitted expansion proposals on Tuesday, Cleveland, Denver, and Cincinnati. Back in April, the NWSL said they were looking to add a team in Q4 of 2024 that would begin play in 2026. The Maui Invitational is heading back to the Lahaina Civic Center for the first time since last year's deadly fires forced the tournament to move to Honolulu. The tournament's return to the island features a stacked lineup of teams, including reigning national champion UConn, North Carolina, Iowa State, Michigan State, Auburn, Memphis, Colorado, and Dayton. Tournament chairman Dave Odom called it one of the strongest fields in the event's history. The WNBA played its first ever game inside Boston's TD Garden on Tuesday night, selling out the arena as the Connecticut Sun held on against the LA Sparks for their 20th win of the season. Despite the massive on-site success for the game, it was not broadcast on national TV. Sun guard Dijonay Carrington ripped the WNBA saying, I think that there could have been a lot more publicity or promo from the top. Connecticut had announced that we were having this game probably almost a year ago. There was ample time to do what needed to get done. I spoke with Connecticut Sun play-by-play voice Brendan Glasheen about the game, Carrington's comments, and the growth of the league. I'm joined now by the Connecticut Sun play-by-play announcer Brendan Glasheen. Welcome, Brendan. Owen, hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, Great to have you. So you called the game on Tuesday between the Sun and Los Angeles Sparks at the TD Garden, home to the Boston Celtics. Describe the vibe for us at that game. Wow. Um, You know, I grew up in Massachusetts, grew up about an hour from the TD Garden. And that for personally, it was a really special night Uh, And for a lot of folks involved. A lot of folks that work for the Sun or or grew up in the area, grew up in New England, but also has have some connections to Boston. It's something they thought about doing about a year. This is my fourth year doing games for the sun. And they thought about doing this about a year and a half ago and kind of thought it was a pipe dream, but through the connection and the chemistry they have with, with the Celtics being the Celtics, having the sun as their sister team, if you will, they, uh, they put this on the schedule back in December. I know a lot of planning went into that before December, the buildup, they had a special, they had an event on Saturday at the New Balance track with a junior camp that went really well into a watch party on Sunday for one of the Sun road games. And then into Tuesday with that big party on Canal Street, uh, right outside of the garden for a couple hours before the game. And then leading in to get 19,000 people there. And it was not a corporate crowd. That was a legit crowd. The game being close certainly helped. But you had a Beat LA chant organically start in the building against the Sparks. I know folks were thinking, oh, they picked the Sparks. It just it kind of worked out that way. Every team submits their home schedule before the season. And then they're just like, it becomes a puzzle, right? And the league's trying to figure out how we make it work. And I think the Sparks, it, it looks good for the branding purposes, I think, having a Los Angeles team 
come to Boston considering the NBA rivalry, but really special, really happy for, for everybody involved, the organization front office, the women involved and, um, Boston showed up. Boston loves its sports. Boston likes winning teams. And I think Boston really likes basketball. Two months ago, they won the NBA championship. They had the big three. Ice Cube's big three was in there this past weekend. But uh, having you know Jason Tatum there, Drew Holiday there, uh, as well as Lauren Holiday, who's an Olympian herself, there was that was legitimate buzz. Uh, good for the league, too. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And yeah, speaking of like the league more broadly, yeah. um, you know, you said you've been at this four years. How have you seen, you know, the, the interest and the excitement progress, you know, over the last four, but especially from last year to this year, the transition players are making now from college to pro the W I think has fully realized, especially this year that using that momentum from the end of the college season, into the pros because they're a summer league. So when the league, when the college season ends first couple weeks of April and they have their draft, they're starting up a month or so later, having that sort of crossover and that smooth transition benefits them. I don't know if the NBA is the NBA has become more of a global league now, right? So you have global superstars like Luca and Jokic and Gilgis Alexander, which is great. Like becoming a global league, that's great. Homegrown stars, the NBA draft didn't generate a whole lot of buzz. The WNBA draft, this year's draft, set records for viewership. And everybody knew who the first pick was going to be. And really the second and the third pick. I think after that it got a little interesting, but there was some legitimate attention on the draft for Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, and even Rakia Jackson, who played in that game at TD Garden on Tuesday. I think she's going to be a hell of a player. Um, So the college momentum, no question, is the biggest difference. But the games, I mean, I've been at it since 21. The revenue in the league has gone up for the last four or five years. Now, has it hit a new complete level this season? No doubt about it. But getting the games, and I bring up the college game because they're the games being on television, absolutely a factor. Now, as that happened, you put the games on TV, not even like, I don't mean just regular season games. I'm talking like conference tournament games. You, ha- you couldn't find them for college basketball. Now, the bubble helped. The, the pandemic forced people to stay home, put on the TV, and, and have something to watch during the summer. I mean, I know everything was shut down from the end of the winter, but even the summer leagues were just more things to watch. But the W, women's college basketball, you couldn't find these games. So the outrage there, I thought, was fair. And it really, they took advantage of that in putting the games on television. So you have that. And then here comes this giant magnetic force in Caitlin Clark becoming the greatest scorer in college women's college basketball history the all-time leading scorer in women's college basketball history so she was the vehicle but that access that was provided a couple years ago opened the door for people to see caitlin clark so i think that's really really important to highlight so those two kind of you know and and, uh, along the same path they simultaneously kind of happened right the league was primed for uh for this kind of thing for you know her and angel reese and just like that excitement they were ready for it in a way they, they probably weren't a few years ago. Yeah. On that national TV point, uh, Dijon A. Carrington of The Sun said after the game at the Garden that, you know, this could have been so much bigger if the WNBA had, you know, put its full force behind it, uh, namely putting it on national TV, but also, you yeah. know, getting its whole, you know, its marketing apparatus behind it. Um, what, what do you make of her comments? I think they're valid. This was announced in December. I don't know how long the league knew about it. Um, We are the Connecticut sun. Their, their TV, local TV home is NBC sports, Boston. In a lot of cases, and and the sun aren't the only team that do this. We'll have home games. A lot of teams in the league will have a simulcast on Amazon prime, CBS sports network. Other times it could be, um, it could be NBA TV. I think that's what she was getting at. Um, now I don't know if all players, coaches and basketball people 
just basketball people in the league, any league. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about DJ. I mean, any. Do they know the intricacies of the business? That's what fascinates me about this new TV deal, because I understand early in the year putting Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese, especially when they went head to head on on ESPN and ABC. The idea, while it was a really tough schedule, was to let's put Caitlin on the same floor as Brianna Stewart. Let's put Caitlin on the floor when she faces the Connecticut Sun, who have been to five straight semifinals. When she plays Diana Taurasi, when she plays Asia Wilson in, in the Las Vegas Aces. Um, but a marquee night like this, and in some of the commentary from the players, I think they kind of admitted this. I don't think they even knew how big Tuesday was going to be because there was no Caitlin Clark. There was no Angel Reese. Cameron Brink tore her ACL two months ago. She plays for the Sparks. She actually tore her ACL against the Connecticut Sun. So we knew Brink wasn't going to play. LA 6-21. and 21. And when I saw a sellout and they sold out the balcony, I- I'm trying to figure out who I give credit to. Like I give credit to the Sun for making it happen. I give credit to the city of Boston. And maybe that opens up maybe the bigger conversation. Is, Bo- is Boston ready for a team? Because that was big time. Um, so, selfishly, oh, and I got to call the game. So, I was excited about that. I think it helped the Sun that they could sell their product on a local RSN. So maybe a national show wouldn't have been fitting. But I almost feel like the league league missed out, kind of. Like, you had a chance to, at the very least, it's on a television. It doesn't have to be on, on your main partner, which is ABC, ESPN. But on an NBA TV, the NBA TV game last night, there were three games at 7 o'clock last night. Dallas and New York was the 7 o'clock game. You know, and Dallas was a good team last year. They've had injuries. They haven't been as good this year. They have Arike Agumbawale, who's an all-star, all-star game MVP. The, there are a lot of good players in the league. There's 12 teams. Like, not some rec- records are bad. I realize that, but injuries pile up in the league often. And um, I think DGNA is just making the point that this was an established game for months, and it didn't feature one of the marquee rookies. Now it could have, because Cameron Brink was could have been thought considered back in December. Right when they they may have been making the schedule then uh, the TV schedule. I mean, so I just think it was. Uh, I think DGNA also what she's really getting at is something that Connecticut has has had to really face, which is small market team. They're always kind of a lit, little engine that could, but they're in it every year. They they have the longest streak in the W of consecutive playoff appearances with seven. I think that's more. That was really more what what a order point was, and maybe new, maybe newer fans to the league don't don't realize that. I, I, which I understand. I think the point was like we have great players. She's not taking away from other games being on TV, but for this, Boston never, Boston's never had a game, and considering the history of the NBA franchise, the Celtics just won the championship. If that would be, that would kind of what would get my mind swirling and moving if i were the if i was the league i'd be like hey they're going to where the the, our 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 men's league just won the title it's going to be the first uh game under our nba umbrella being played there since the celtics won the championship two months ago and i I wonder if uh, another thing you know maybe behind carrington's comments and i'm just wondering if there's a little bit of an undercurrent with some players that all this attention is going to Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese and, you know, New York and Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that it, it's too focused on them when there's good basketball being played throughout the league. Do you get any of that vibe either in Carrington's comments or, or just from other players? Tuesday night made a lot of people's points that feel the other way. 19,000 people went to Boston and packed a building without the top two discussed rookies that have now brought eyeballs to the league. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that. So I think it's easier to come out and say what she said after the game, having known that because it went really well. Like I told you earlier, like they had a on canal street, which is right outside Causeway, right by the TD garden. They had a full packed block party. It was, 
it felt like a pre-playoff game in, in the NBA playoffs. If the Celtics were having a game, it was outdoors and people are walking the streets having a good have a good having a good time. Um Clark is a vehicle. The Reese Clark dynamic, I've heard the comparisons to Magic and Bird. Like what that might mean. The WNBA, comparatively speaking to the NBA, the, the W is almost 30 years old as a league. They're not quite there yet. I think it's 20, this is year 27 or 28. Well, in the 80s, when the NBA was about the same age, the NBA finals were on tape delay. And then in came Jordan, uh, pardon me, in came Magic, in came Bird. And that guy who played at North Carolina who signed one of the biggest shoe deals ever, and we know the rest. It became like must-watch, networks hopped on it, and they're, they're, the NBA becomes a must-watch product on live television. Um, so Kate, Caitlin has opened so many doors and now it's, how do we capitalize and how do we tell stories of Dewana Bonner, who I don't think many people know about her. And I get that. So I think that's where they're, that's where they're coming from. I think Dijanae is a younger player. She's in her fourth year. She played in big games in college, played at Baylor. Kim Mulkey was at Baylor, now at LSU. Kim Mulkey kind of empowered her players to have some edge. Carrington kind of plays with some edge, so her personality has some edge to it. She plays with Alyssa Thomas. She plays with Bonner, who, uh, Brianna Jones. They've been in this league 10 years. So she, I think, recognizes, like, aren't we have, we have damn good players here. And she wants to speak up for them because Bonner and Thomas are kind of more, uh, more reserved, uh, not as outspoken. I think that's really where it comes from. They're just trying to vouch for each other. So I, I know folks have used the word jealousy and pettiness. I don't think so. I think they're just trying to, I think they're trying to speak up for their, for their teammates in the history of the league. And, and Caitlin Clark is absolutely a vehicle behind what's happened for this league. No question about it. Brendan Glasheen, really appreciate getting the first person perspective on a big night. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. This was, it was a really cool night personally. And uh, I think it's a, it was a big, big step for, for the entire league. So thank you. In one of the more obvious matches in recent memory, Angel Reese is teaming up with Reese's Candy in a new partnership. Fans of the Chicago Sky rookie began calling themselves Reese's Pieces back in June and called for an apparel collab with the Hershey's brand. Two months later, it's happening as Reese and Reese's get set to launch their collaboration, Reese's Angel. After winning a national championship with USC, Pete Carroll is heading back to SoCal, but not to replace Lincoln Riley. Carroll is going to teach a class. On Tuesday, the legendary coach told Seattle's 93.3 KJR that he would be returning to the school as an instructor, but added that he could coach tomorrow if he wanted to. While he was not able to give any more details while the hire is being finalized, Carroll said that it's going to be a really exciting endeavor. Carroll was USC's head coach from 2001 to 2009 and won the national championship in 2003. USC also won the BCS championship in 2004, but that title was stripped by the league. He technically is still in an advisor role for the Seattle Seahawks, but reportedly has not been in communication with the team. As you'll recall, Warner Bros. Discovery is not giving up on keeping the NBA and has taken its case to court. Now the NBA is fighting to keep some key documents out of the public eye, and the judge presiding over the case happens to have a particular history with the NBA from his days as an attorney. Front Office Sports reporter Alex Schiffer has the details, and he joins us next. I'm joined now by front office sports breaking news and enterprise reporter Alex Schiffer. Welcome, Alex. What's going on, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. So you've been tracking the lawsuit from Warner Bros. Discovery against the NBA, in which WBD is saying we exercised our matching rights and should be granted NBA media rights. And the NBA is saying your match isn't valid, doesn't count. What's the latest here? Yeah, we've had a couple of developments in the past three weeks or so, and, and this Cases and probably going to head to trial till October, really close to the tip off of the NBA season. Um, you know, in late July, the judge Joel Cohen out of NY Supreme Court said that you know there's a possible conflict of interest. Before becoming a judge, he was an, an attorney in one of the greatest business of sports lawsuits we ever saw, where the former owners of the Spirits of St. Louis ABA team essentially netted eight hundred million dollars from asking for a seventh of NBA future TV revenue back in the 70s when the merger happened. And he helped his clients get that nine figure bag. And both sides essentially said like, no, nah, you're good. You can keep being judging this. And then, uh, you know, this, this past week, there was a filing August 12th in which the NBA essentially asked the court to keep the media agreements and it's the, the 
real juice of the deal, I guess, sealed under, uh, kept under seal for the, uh, the entirety of the lawsuit out of fear that it would get into the public and potentially become a, a negotiating problem for the NBA down the road. So, you know, the, the lawsuit happened shortly after the media rights get filed, and, and we've already had some kind of interesting curveballs thrown in all this before we even get into the courtroom. That last part is pretty interesting. You, you can understand how, you know, these leagues, these media partners always want to keep this stuff confidential because that's just that makes their lives that much easier. But the claim that the NBA is making is that the WBD did not did not effectively match the offer by Amazon um, and therefore the NBA can drop TNT for Amazon. Um, but how are we to know that? How is, how is anyone to know that if they're keeping this offer under wraps? So, um, yeah, do we know kind of like any next steps here in terms of like figuring out um, where this little detail goes? Because it seems pretty crucial. Yeah, it's, it's on the judge to determine whether or not they're going to keep those under seal and, and only in the courtroom. You know, things always leak. So I kind of wonder even if they are kept under seal if we find we still find details one way or another. The, the interesting thing to me about all this is that, you know, the, the NBA media rights agreement is for 11 years. It starts next season, you know, 25 um, to 26, it kicks in. And for an 11 year agreement, you know, them talking about the proprietariness of these agreements and how it could hurt them down the road with future negotiating partners. 11 years in media, Owen, I don't need to tell you, is a really long time. Who knows what any of us are coming at? Um, maybe maybe we're doing an AI Alex and Owen talk on Front Office Sports today a decade from now. Um, so it, it's crazy to me that, you know, I, I understand a little bit of where the NBA is coming from, but I also just think, like, in a rapidly changing media environment where who knows who the players are, you know, who, whoever imagined Amazon that started out selling books, getting a piece of the NBA media rights deal 10 years ago, right? So, um, or, or maybe a little before that. So the, the interesting thing to me with all this is you're saying that this could hurt you, you know, 10, 11 years from now when you begin negotiating your next deal. But look at the, you know, NBC dropped their deal with, with the NBA in 2002 and, and no one really saw them getting back in until the past few years. So just this is such a crazy world we live in. You know, my friend who's a TV anchor in, uh, in Atlanta, shout out Lauren, always says the only constant is change. So, so. I don't fully agree with the reasoning just because I don't like who could possibly predict the future of this industry and who a play, who's a player, what the money ages to and all that. And that, that's where I'm kind of skeptical of the NBA's argument a little bit. Yeah, it feels like a reasoning that's just been used in the past of like, oh, yeah, we, we can't show any of our, our papers, our books here because, uh, you know, that that could, you know, disadvantage us down the road. But yeah, like you said, in a decade I don't know how we're going to be watching NBA games and probably neither does the NBA. And so, and, and, and who's going to be involved? Like, you know, of the major media companies we have right now, which of them are still going to be in a position to bid on the NBA? What is the NBA going to look like? So yeah, more unknowns than known in that realm. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how the judge rules. Yeah. I, I kind of like as a non-legal expert and, uh, someone who never went to law school, obviously. I like that they kept the judge in place because I actually think it's quite interesting that this judge in particular just so happens, and I think you know this kind of came together as coincidence, but this judge, Joel Cohen, has an extensive knowledge of NBA media rights, and this is obviously a complex case. So I I'm really curious to see what his rulings are, what his reasoning is, and kind of how that all impacts the trial because you could argue, I think make an argument for either side that it it's in – uh, it's in their better interest to have a judge with, you know, intricate knowledge of these things rather than, you know, a total stranger who might understand some of the, uh, the complexities and intricacies of these deals. Yeah, absolutely. Should be good courtroom drama whenever it gets going. Alex Schiffer, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me, Owen. Today had all of the makings for the greatest pickleball match of our lives. Two of the best tennis players in the world, Novak Djokovic and Yannick Sinner, set to square off in Head's NYC mashup pickleball tournament, even after Sinner's doping scandal was thrust back into the public eye this week. But ironically, it's actually Djokovic who is drawing the most ire. Last month, the Joker said that the worldwide emergence of pickleball and other more accessible racket sports was endangering tennis, which he called the king or queen of racket sports. Nonetheless, the 24-time Grand Slam champion announced his intention to face Sinner in the NYC event. However, Express UK reports that Djokovic has been told to withdraw from the tournament after he upset the tennis bosses with his intended participation in the tournament after his rant last month. 
At this moment, it looks like Djokovic will still participate, but suddenly a friendly matchup that had so much intrigue is marked by controversy, which of course only increases the intrigue. The Buffalo Bills released renderings for their new Highmark Stadium. While the phrase Bills fans tends to elicit diehards whose fervor for the team seems to make them impervious to the cold, the renderings communicate the exact opposite vibe and could easily be mistaken for a trendy high-end spot in Manhattan. The renderings show Bills fans enjoying sleek looking lounges and bars. In one image there is a window through which you can see fans in stands but they're too small in the image to see what they are fans of and you might miss them entirely due to the gas fireplace lining the opposite wall and the translucent metal curtain separating two areas in which people are sitting on couches and not paying attention to the game through the window on one side or the large screen on the other. That stands in stark contrast to a different set of renderings that just dropped which depict the Stade Hassan II in Casablanca, Morocco. The stadium resembles a desert tent if a desert tent could hold 115,000 people and a soccer field in the middle. As designed, the Stade Hassan II would be the second largest stadium in the world and set to host World Cup games when the tournament comes to Spain, Portugal, and Morocco in 2030. The stadium will cost an estimated $500 million to build, which is less than a third of the $1.7 billion estimated for the Bills' new home, half of which will be paid for by taxpayers. The Dartmouth men's basketball team has filed a petition to the National Labor Relations Board as part of their efforts to unionize. The school and the NCAA are fighting this in every way they can because the case could represent an existential threat to the amateurism model that treats college athletes as students with a very involved extracurricular activity, not employees. My colleague Amanda Krisovich explains all of that and more next. Joined now by front office sports reporter Amanda Kristovich. Welcome, in, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Great, great to have you on. Uh, so we have a, a new development in one of the several parallel narratives around college athletes trying to get paid and get rights. The Dartmouth men's basketball team has filed a petition with the National Labor Relations Board in their attempt to unionize. Uh, give us some details about what this petition's about, and if you could put it in context for us about the significance of this action. Yeah, so today uh, the Dartmouth men's basketball team filed what's called an unfair labor practice charge um, with the National Labor Relations Board, and it's against Dartmouth College. And basically what it is is a complaint that you can file with the NLRB to say, hey, um, you know, it's not a petition, hey, we want to unionize. It's a petition, hey, we have a labor complaint. We think that the people we're trying to bargain with are doing something illegal. Uh, it's the same sort of type of complaint that uh, was filed against USC, um, not in terms of like what they're alleging, but in terms of like the sort of category and the logistical um, sort of long winding road that now is ahead of Dartmouth. Um, this was an expected complaint because Dartmouth, the school, refuses to bargain with the players, even though the players were able to unionize um, because of a decision. Uh, in the winter, and then they voted to unionize, joined the local union chapter that does all the bargaining at Dartmouth, um, that has worked with Dartmouth for years, and they said this in a statement today. They're like, okay, well, for some reason, the men's basketball team is the only group of um, quote-unquote employees that you refuse to bargain with. Um, Dartmouth came back and said, this is all part of our plan. We knew it was going to happen. We knew they were going to file this complaint because, yes, we do, in fact, refuse to bargain. And we are using every legal avenue available to keep these players from being considered employees. Yeah. And on that latter point, so is that their essential legal argument that we don't bargain with non-employees and you guys are not employees? Is that sort of the thrust of their case here? Yes. Um, you know, but the other and they're going to appeal and that's what they're going to say on appeal. But even if they lose the appeal and the ULP ends up being adjudicated, that is a process that could be appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. It could go outside of um, the National Labor Relations Board framework. And that's exactly what Dartmouth wants to do. Dartmouth wants to tie this up in court as long as possible and potentially get it out of the NLRB, especially given that the NLRB currently is a little bit, you know, sort of pro-labor, more liberal leaning because, um, you know, it's being controlled by the Biden administration. So they're trying to get it out into, you know, tied up and eventually into a federal court system that they think might be more amenable to, you know, giving a position or, or a ruling that's favorable to them. If it does get to the Supreme Court, 
it does feel like, um, you know, they're not necessarily going to get any better an audience there, given um, the Supreme Court's actions in the Alston case. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's weird because the Alston case was an antitrust case and uh, this is a labor case. So, you know, we certainly know that there are um, more, quote unquote, conservative justices like Brett Kavanaugh, who wrote a concurring opinion in the Alston case, even though it wasn't about employment. He said the NCA's business model of not paying players would be flatly illegal in any other industry. And that's almost a direct quote. I might have a word or two off there. Um, but you know, ultimately, we don't really 100% know if it will be as easy of a 9-0 win as Alston was, because again, a, a labor case like this is very partisan. It's pro-labor, anti-labor. Um, and that's also why Republicans and Democrats in Congress have taken sort of differing positions on it in a way that they kind of didn't with NIL or some other antitrust issues. So we'll have to see. Um, but certainly, you know, after what happened with Alston, it, it leads one to wonder what is going on in the minds of the folks who are behind the NCA's legal team that makes them feel comfortable taking that risk again. And you wrote in your piece about this that if the basketball team is ultimately successful, that could spell the end of amateurism. Why Why does this go from the Dartmouth men's basketball team to basically the whole college system? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of debate about this, and the NLRB only has jurisdiction over the private sector. So technically, this decision um, would only give um, the opportunity for private school Division I athletes to unionize, not public school. However, I personally, if you want to look at the way NIL – everything with NIL shook out, I think that that is enough to unravel the last bastion of amateurism, really, that we have left, which is the employment question. Because the, with the House case, we're even about to get revenue sharing. It's just not called employment. Um, if there are a bunch of private school athletes who can unionize, the NCA is going to have to let the public school athletes do so, too, through you know the different mechanisms and means that would be available to them. It's a completely separate process. But, you know, it was kind of like, if you remember, California passed a law, Florida passed a law, certain states started passing laws saying that, you know, the school, the athletes have to be allowed to benefit from NIL. And the NCAA ultimately decided they couldn't function with some of the states, some allowing NIL and some of them not. So I feel like it's similar here. So even though legally, technically, it's not everyone, I think it would affect everybody. Very interesting stuff. Amanda Christovich, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. In one of the most classic New York things ever, the Yankees are beefing with a Staten Island Little League coach. Coach Bob Laterza accused star player Aaron Judge of ignoring his players over the weekend when the Yankees spent time with Little League players saying, how about turning around or waving to New York and the kids that think you're a hero? They are the ones who pay your salary. Unfortunately for Laterza, the video evidence doesn't necessarily support his takeaway. Judge is seen talking to multiple players and attempting to mingle through a massive crowd around him. It is difficult to tell from the video what team everyone plays for, but the chaos was palpable. The Yankees have clearly taken an exception to Laterza's claims and released a public statement on Tuesday night calling Aaron Judge one of the great ambassadors of our sport and a role model worth celebrating. They added that, win or lose, we intend to invite the Staten Island team to Yankee Stadium. However, it would have been much better if Staten Island's coach called us to understand the facts before bitterly reacting in such a public fashion. New York, New York. Just days after Oklahoma State head coach Mike Gundy ripped NIL agents for blowing up his phone, the team is launching a brand new NIL fundraising initiative, QR Codes on Helmets. Every player on the team will have a scannable code that allows fans to directly contribute to the general team NIL fund that covers all players. The QR codes will not be visible for fans in the stands, but rather are intended to be scanned by fans watching on TV. The codes themselves will only be 1.5 square inches. You might be thinking, wow, Mike Gundy must hate this. On the contrary, Gundy said of the initiative, this is a revolutionary step forward to help keep Oklahoma State football ahead of the game. It gives a chance for everyday fans across the world to have a real impact when it comes to supporting the NIL efforts for Cowboy football. I'm thrilled about this opportunity for our players. Quite the switch up. Before we go, here is flag football quarterback Daryl Doucette saying that the nuances of flag are different from those of the NFL, and therefore, when it comes to his sport, he is better than a certain NFL QB you may have heard of. At the end of the day, 
I feel like I'm better than Patrick Mahomes because of my IQ of the game. I know he's right now the best in the league. I know he's more accurate. I know he has all these intangibles. But when it comes to flag football, I feel like I know more than him. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend and share this episode with them and anyone you think would be interested. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.